Okay. <clears throat> well, the name is Francis Schultz, S-C-H-O-L-T-Z, and Francis with an I. And uh, I was na nicknamed Dutch in the service because I was associated with a, it was a sort of a play on, play on words with some guy who was a gangster and I was just the opposite of a gangster. So the, the name, nickname Dutch, that would came to me. I would get that nickname on Guadalcanal. <clears throat> I started out in, in Hawaii. Well, first of all, I was in, enlisted and I was in the United States for one year before the war started. <clears throat> when the war started, I, they told me, how oh, I put this? I didn't know where the hell I was going to go, but anyway, they, they said, just report to the base, and so I did, and then they shipped me to um, I'm trying to decide how to get this out. Come on. Dutch, uh, they want to know what your rank was when you were, uh, and. Yeah. Dutch, if you don't mind, when we're talking, um, I know there's a lot of heads on this. Uh, I think I think we have it set up to where if you look at me, it's yeah. best. Yeah, so you guys right. can just talk. Yeah, yeah. So does All right. that work? Okay. Yeah. So were you you were private at the time of Pearl Harbor? I was a private. Okay. And I was private first class or private? Just private. Private. Okay. Then after the war started, I became private first class, and I was on Hawaii, and I was, and then after we, the war started. Uh, I was, well, I had been working with the chaplain at, at Wiener Field, and he had a piano, and uh, so and I played it every day practically, because I loved the piano. <clears throat> so then I, when the war started, I found out that he was going to get a new piano, so I, I asked him if I could buy the second-hand piano that he called Branson, Big Upright. He said, yeah, so it's 50 bucks. So I bought it for 50 bucks, got a bunch of GIs and a truck, and moved it across the island because after the war started, we were moved from Hawaii and from Wheeler Field across to um, Dillingham Ranch which is a horse ranch. And it was, we set up our camp there. And then uh, so that piano was very popular because the guys all like to sing, and they like music. And so I, I, I was there way there, we were in Dillingham Ranch probably about maybe a month or two months. And then uh, we got orders to move again. So the next order was to move didn't know where we were going. So I asked our commanding officer, which is Captain Sanders, who I had been playing piano for his, for his social events because he, on Hawaii, before the war started, officers were, had their wives there and they had social events. And so I played for their cocktail parties. So anyway, he said, I said, I'd like to take the piano with me when I go. He said, sure. He said, I'll, I'll see that you get the piano. I'll see that you it follows you. So I, about one week later, I shipped out to Christmas Island. I didn't know where I was going, but that's where it was. Christmas Island just was, I was a, just a, it was just a beach is all it was. White is, you had to wear sunglasses all the time. A white beach. And so I, I was there about a month and I was on a boat that was doing, doing, surfacing around the island, picking up guys that sort of went in and drink. And 
uh, the guys, the, the big ship come in, they couldn't get to the island. They just anchored offshore. And the guys on the top said, well, Dutch, your piano's on board. So I said, fine, wonderful. Anyway, and I, so we picked up the, the captain, the new, the new officer that was going to be the, the head of our, of our outfit on the beach in, in Christmas Island. And he was on the launch that I was on. So I was visiting with him on the way in. He said, he said, I couldn't even bring my dog, but he said, I found a piano in the hole. He said, I couldn't believe it. I said, well, it was mine. I said, it was my piano. He, he, he just couldn't believe it. Anyway, I got in there and uh, he got the, the piano. It was, was uh, stayed right in tune. And so I was there about a month, Mr. Southern, and we got orders to move again. So I had a brand new commanding officer, and he had no history with me at all. I asked him if we could take the piano as a morale thing for the, for the troops. He said, yes, we can. He said, if he said if I'll get somebody to create it up. So he got the squadron carpenter to make a big square crate of heavy lumber about that thick. And then I, square, and he wouldn't know it was a piano. It was a big box. But they hauled that like they did all the other stuff and uh, on, on board the ship. And so they hauled it. And so we went, we went from Christmas Island to New Hebrides. We were on New Hebrides for about two months. And we got moved again. So we were moving again. So I had different CO again. So I went to him, same, same story. And he said, sure, we'll take the piano. So he bought, we had it, saved the box. So we moved from, from New Hebrides then to Guadalcanal. And then Guadalcanal, we, I, was, I was in the sick bay. I got really terribly sick. And so when I finally got out, I didn't know, I didn't know how the hell I was going to get home. I was walking, I got ride with a, with a GI truck. And um, the piano was up in our outfit. They had never taken it out of the crate and just left it on the truck. So they finally uncrated it, put, put it in the tent, and I, they, had a, they made a sign uh, outside our tent. We were on top of the hill, right near the air base, the air strip was below us, and we were high up on the hill. We call it Harmony Hill. And so um, they brought the piano in my tent, and it's, it's, the picture's down there somewhere. And so I, so I played the piano, and people came, other outfits came from all over the island then to play the piano, to listen, and some had their own piano players, and so they'd always bring booze, and so we had party for the, so the guys in the tent didn't mind. There was something going on all the time. And so that went on for probably, well, long time actually, probably about a year. And at that time, Guadalcanal was, was in, mo mostly what happened there is they blew up the ammunition dump, which was horrendous. And uh, then after I had, I had left the CO, my commanding officer from, from Wheeler Field, became a, um, a captain. And so he, he ended up being just visiting, and so he ran into me then. Stutz, what are you doing here? I said, I just this is where I and listen. This is where I ended up. He said, you got the piano. I said, yep. And so then he he stuck around for a while, and then he got another he got another assignment, and so I didn't see him again until we were on a trip on our honeymoon up in northern Wisconsin, up in. I forget what the name of Tom was. Anyway, early, you know, we're eating breakfast, and and then this guy comes in, and he was not in uniform. I said, that's, I said, that's my key. That's my former CO. So he spotted me at the table, and he says, Dutch, he said, how are you? And he come over and talking. Captain Sanders, he was now a general. And so he... Uh, he, he reflected on all the good time we had with the piano. 
But the piano was in Guadalcanal when we had air raids and we had one every night for 26 nights straight. And after the air raid, I would sit down and play the piano. And I was on, we were up on a high hill, so you could, oh, he could hear it over the whole outfit. And so guys would have requests. So I played the requests and it went on for maybe an hour or so. And uh, so it was a kind of an entertainment piece for the outfit all the time I was with it. And um, the, I'm trying to think of what was the most, got a question here? So we never wore uniform. We all, all I wore in, in Hawaii and all the islands shorts. That's all I wore. So that's how. how it, and the piano was a full size Gal Branson, and those pictures on there are Petty Girls. That was very popular in Esquire magazine. So how old were you at the time that Pearl Harbor happened? I was nineteen. You were nineteen. Okay. So born in twenty two. Yep. 22. Okay. So tell me about, uh, now I know Pearl Harbor being on a Sunday, were you by any chance playing piano at the church that morning or? No, I was supposed to play, but I didn't that morning because we had the attack and it, the attack was unbelievable. We, we didn't know it was coming, obviously, although I wish I'd say this, that we had been on the alert for a month before Pearl Harbor and that meant that we had, you know, our stuff, our airplanes out in the in the boondocks, and not on the on the tarmac. And then the day before Pearl Harbor, our commanding officer called us into the hangar. He said, "I do not understand this." He said, "But we're going off the alert, and you're free to go on pass." So you know, I just took off for Hawaii and Honolulu, obviously. And then I, that same night, then. We were attacked, and then, then the piano. No, no, you were playing a dance job that night. Yeah, the night I didn't get in until about one o'clock in the morning. And that's why you didn't go. I was in bed when the so attack the, so started. So the day before, sorry, take me through the day before you were playing a dance that night. Tell <laughs> yeah, me about that. Well, I was playing a dance job for the officers' club, and uh, I had a dance band, about 18 pieces. You know, all the guys that played different instruments we had a great time. And so, so when I woke up and everything was, all hell was breaking loose, I thought, well, what am I going to do? And so I, I just plastered myself up against the wall. And we had no, no, no uh, dugouts or anything prepared for, for any kind of that combat. So I just plastered myself up against the officers residence's wall, and I stood there and watched airplanes come in and bomb and strafe our, our outfit, which was just 30, 30 yards from the hangar line. They just come in, right? And the machine's gun roaring away, and then they dropped the bombs. And so they just about wiped out all, most of our airplanes. And because they, they had been on the alert for, for uh, I said for about a, you know, several months, and so they brought all the airplanes in the night before Pearl Harbor, and lined them up on the apron, so the, the Japs just, just knocked the hell out of them, and just strafed them. And so, what was the name of your barracks? They were stationed in. I was at uh, Wheeler Field. Wheeler Field, okay. Wheeler Field. And now, what was your position? Were you just primarily a piano player, or did no, you have I, my my position was a private first class at that time. Okay. And I was a radio man. Radio man. I took it care. It just so happened to be you were good enough at piano to get yeah. regular gigs yeah. with that, I see. So you are awoken on the morning of by the attack. Yeah. And you can see it through oh, yeah. your, your window. You're oh, watching the whole thing unfold through your window. No, not through the window. I, as soon as we had the first bomb drop, I was out on the back, out on the outside. And I, we were only 50 yards from the hangar line, and it was coming right over our barracks. I just stood out there and watched him come in. 
watch the airplane come in, and they were strafing at the same time. So I knew that wasn't the place to be, so I just went back away from the hangar line to the officer's quarters and plastered myself up against the wall. And that, and I just stayed there till the thing, attack was over. Did they have uh, kind of um, battle posts that you were supposed to report to? No. Well, we, we, knew, we knew we had jobs to do. Like, I, my job was a radio man. As soon as the first attack was over, I, we had to get, get down to the Tanger line. I got the, the contact with Fort Shafter, which was the center, the center thing for the island. And we got the portable radio and, uh, and put it into a, a nest, which was like a gun, gun emplacement nest. Had that in there. And then I contacted Fort Shafter and I said, we're, we're being attacked. And they just said, well, they, they thought that we were going to save them, of course, because we had airplanes. But we were, everybody was attacked at the same time. And in fact, I think they hit the airplanes first. Did you see the actual planes getting hit by uh, oh, strafing sure. and bomb fire? Oh, yeah. And you saw them oh, yeah. blow up? Yeah. yeah. So I'm in the air. Uh, one, of the, one of our pilots, I saw one of our pilots get killed, get shot down. Because they, they were, they're not flying high, they were right close to the ground. And so they, it was, a, it was a one, one big mess. Was that the only casualty you personally saw of that day? Yes. One of the pilots? Yeah. Was the pilot running from the fire or? He was part of the, I, he was just part of the, a dog fight with it. With the Japanese plane. Oh, you saw the pilot up in the air? Yeah. So it was one of the few pilots who made it up. You saw that plane. Yeah. Did you find out later who that pilot was? Uh, I think his name was Sterling. And so the, and we had, our airplanes were P-36s, which were antiques compared to the Japanese. The Japanese had zeros. Mitsubishi zero. They were fast and they were very, um, lightweight. lightweight, yeah. But the, most of the weight was in gun armory. Mm. Anyway, um, so you saw that plane get shot out of the, yes. the air. That must have been pretty horrific. Well, it all was horrific. I was a nightmare, and um, and so they, after the first attack, I thought I was going. To, I was supposed to go to church. That was Sunday morning, and I had to go to Fort Shafter for church, but. It never, never made it because we had another attack that came in after that, and this, another wave of, of Japanese pilots, and so um, never got there. So essentially, the timeline is: night before you were playing at the officers' club piano, yeah. You were back at your uh, barracks at the yeah. airfield, yeah. Uh, and then when you woke up to the sound of the airfield being bombed and strafed, I got out of my, I got out of my sack and I picked out the door. Of our shack, and I was only, you know, 50 yards or less from the hangar line, so they were drive bombing down and they and machine gunning and dropped the bombs, so you could see it all. So then I moved back after the first wave, just to get out of the way because I had no we we had turned in our rifles the night before. We had no, no ammunition, nothing. That was I don't know what that was. That was somebody crooked in Denmark. So you didn't have a weapon you could run to at the no, time? No, nothing. So that's so, why you had to brace up against the wall because right. you had no method of defense. No method of defense. So... Did you ever find out why? No. No. I never found out why. It's a big but mystery. You said that your captain, you said that when they called you in the night before, you didn't really finish that sentence to hand in everything. You said that he didn't understand why this was happening because we knew that Well, that was, we, had, we had a meeting in the hangar the day before the attack. It, I mean, Captain Sanders was our CO, and he said, I don't understand this. We know the Japanese fleet is out there, but we're going off the alert, and you're free to go on past. And so, uh, naturally, the guys have been, we've been alert for a month, and the guys ran off to Honolulu, and I had a dance job that night, and that that was it. And so the alert 
lasted right up until the day before yeah. Pearl Harbor. So the first attack happens. You're bracing up against the wall to wait for it, essentially, to end. It ends, and then that's when you well, no, then there was, to the radio. Calls. Yeah, then you try to find out what's going on, and then it wasn't long, there was another wave came in. And they, I think they, as I found out later, they attacked the Air Force first before they took in the Navy because they were afraid of the airplanes. And so that's, that's how it worked. Then you told me. Then after the first attack, then you went to the end of the field where you. Yeah, well, that was. Set up your we had we, we had we had operations uh, routine that we were having to do. So after the attack, we went from I had we walked the length of the airfield to a, just a, a bunker where we had a, a, one of these we field phones and they contacted Fort Shafter, which was the. the near the center of the island and called in and they said, How many do you have any planes available? And I said, We think we, we had two or three that were ready to fly. And so then they, they gave us orders where it, where they should go. So we told the pilots and they took off and that was it. And then you said then you weren't you strafed while you were in the Oh that sure. Place? Well we were in those when once we got out, we were in those this little was place in Wrangler. There were there were we we had bags of cement or sandbags. sandbags on top around in this like a gun emplacement, and so uh, as we were talking on the phone, they were strafing us, and so in fact I a bullet just went right my ear. I had I carried it for a long time, and I lost it, but I took it. I think I showed it to you. Yeah, I got it. So sorry, a, a bullet, a, a a zero bullet, yeah. went right past. Yeah. Tell me about that, like the specific of where you what. Well, I was right by. I was in, right in front of the, the sandbags were about about that high from the ground, and and I was behind the sandbag, but he came from behind, and dived down, and he was strafing us, because everything was just it was absolutely pandemonium. About that same time that the Pearl Harbor was happening, there were B-17s that were coming in from from. United States, and they came in and they didn't landed it right across the runway. They didn't go down the runway, they come across by just to get on the ground. And they had no, no armament, nothing to protect themselves with. So that was, it was just crazy. Now, did the incident where you almost got hit, was that <coughs> in the first or the second? That was in the second wave. That was in the first wave. First, oh, okay. Was in the second wave. Oh yeah, it was. You were wave. indoors for yeah. the first wave. Yeah, second wave. So second was so first wave ends. Sec in between the two waves, that's when you were radioing. Yeah. Back about the attack. What else was going on in that time between these? Well, I guess what was the timeline of what you did between first and second? Well, I didn't, there wasn't that much time between the first and second. I think they, when, I, the, when I had said about going down to the end of the field to call in the fourth chapter, that was after the second. It was after the second. Oh. Yeah. So what would, I guess, where were you when the second attack started? Where is that when you were behind the sandbags? Yeah. Okay. So did, did you see, I guess, others around you? Were they trying to get arms and firing back? Oh, sure. It? We had one guy that had, he had somehow had kept a gun, and he, and he was shooting at the airplanes as he came over. But he, he's, he was only, the only one that had one. I don't know how he kept it. Stop I suppose it he was a pillow or something. I think it probably was on guard duty or something. Oh. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, it's a very frustrating thing to be completely weaponless and being under the mercy of somebody with everything going, going to hell. So this was somebody maybe in your company who was firing back? No, it wasn't our company. It was somebody else. But, but there was... You know, everybody was, the whole place was a disaster. So what did you, I guess, when did you know the attack was over? I didn't really know it was over. I knew the first wave was over. We thought that was the end, but it wasn't. Then they came back again. But by that time, we got some planes in the air. And so we got planes up, and there were some dogfights. 
and our, we lost our first officer, Sterling his name was, and, that, and he got shot down. Did you ever see what was going on on Battleship Row at this point? Were you within visible sight of Battleship Row? Well, did you see we, any of the smoke from there? Oh yeah, you see the smoke. But we were in Hawaii, where we were in, in, in uh, Winter Field, was way up above the, uh, the harbor. So you could look down and see, but you couldn't see individual ships, but you could see the, the, you know, the, the, the gulf. And then the, they were firing guns. It was just f fierce. Could you see the, did you see or hear the Arizona blow up? No, I don't know. It was just, just one thing after another exploding. Didn't know, didn't know what was blowing up. Um, you saw the smoke. You could yeah. see the smoke and the fire. So when the second attack ended, were you still behind the sandbags? Yeah, no. We had by that time we we had moved. As I said, we went down the end of the field. Okay. Was there a safety spot yeah, down there? Sandbags. Oh, sandbags. Okay. That's what I call Fort Shafter. So by the end of the second attack, you were at Fort Shafter? Yeah. Okay. I, wouldn't, I wasn't at it. No. I just okay. called them. Oh. oh, okay. I see. So second attack ends. What was the timeline for you from there? Well, then that was when we, we, were, we got orders to get some of our planes in the air. So we get, that's how we got one guy shot down, and we shot down some Japanese airplanes. Commanding officer came down. He was, he was just beside himself. He, he couldn't understand how this could happen. His name was Sanders. <clears throat> so what did you do? I guess what was your? Did you go report somewhere after the second attack, or that was when you made the yeah. call? Obviously, that yeah. the attack was happening. The only the only uh, report I had was when I called Fort Shafter to let them know we had. Two airplanes ready to fly. Just two? Yeah. The rest of them had probably been destroyed. Well, they, see, as I said, we were on, the, before the Pearl Harbor, we were off, we were not on the, we were on the alert, and our planes were way back in earthen bunkers, and then the day before Pearl Harbor, we went off the alert, they brought all the planes back in, lined them up on the tarmac, and so they were just like sitting ducks, and, and so, we were we were just victims of that whole business. What was the rest of the day like? Did you see? Did you ever make it down to Battleship Row? No. You were mainly. You staked. could see it. You could see the the fire, the smoke, just incredible smoke from from blowing up all those ships. So you didn't see some of the horrors that maybe some of the other guys, as no. far as maybe being near a hospital no, or no. near some of the ships no. where they were trying to save. No. Nope. Some folks, okay. Too far away. So take me through, you know, maybe the rest of that day and maybe even the week after. What were you doing during that time? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. The rest of that day was mostly spent with trying to get ready for the next attack. We thought they would come back and really try to take the island. And that was our fear, because they could have. We had, they pretty well wiped out our, our, our Navy and our Air Force. And so they, that was, you know, that was just talk. We knew, we knew, nobody knew anything. So it was, we, did, we just were, lived in fear. Did you think that another attack? Oh, yeah. I, didn't, I thought we'd surely be attacked again. Did you tell me it, it, there was a rumor that they were, yeah. the island had been or was going to be invaded? Yeah. Now, did you see the firefight that night where they shot friendly fired some planes that were coming in because they yeah, thought they were dead? Yeah, that was the B-727s or whatever. Yeah. Did you see the, the fire at night from that? Yeah. But it, you see, when you say, I don't even know what it was. It was just it was so far away. So was did you lose any friends in the attack? Yes. Well, no, I lost him later. Uh, I, can't think of, I can't think of his name now. Don Plant. Don Plant? Don Plant, yeah, from Wausau, Wisconsin. 
in Guadalcanal? Yeah. No, he no, he was killed at Pearl Harbor. He was killed at the attack. Is yeah. What you told me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting a little confused. Drink of water. <laughs> yeah, if we need to stop or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Something that's different, right? Is there yeah, is everything okay, quick. Ethan? As far as the cord? Yeah. No, I have it mostly. Um, yeah, I have it mostly out of the frame, so okay. we're, we're good on that. Just flip real quick. So you're serving in the army. Air Pearl Corps. Harbor happens. Army Air Corps. Army Air Corps. Pearl happens. Pearl Harbor happens. Where, where were you? Did you stay at Pearl Harbor for a while and maybe help with cleanup or? Oh, but we were, we were really stationed at Wheeler Field, which is above Pearl Harbor. Right. And so we were we had it probably three three or four days after that, we were, we got orders to move, and so we went, we went into farther into Hawaii, away from the airfield, away from the, the, the naval base, and we, on Dillingham Ranch. We moved all our airplanes out there, we set up shop out there, and we, we operated off that ranch. It was a huge ranch, horse ranch. And so, um, Dillingham Ranch. And so we were there for about, oh, maybe a month or and then we got orders to move again, but this time the move was to Christmas Island. Christmas Island. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Little, little visual aids here. What was? The, how long did you remain in Hawaii after the attack? Was it weeks, months? Oh, just weeks. Then we move. Anyway, they tried to get. Disperse the airplanes and get them off the island because they were all centered in one place. They were just the sitting ducks. So that's why they moved to Christmas Island. Yeah. Um, did you? Uh, I guess what was the mood like in those weeks after Pearl Harbor on Hawaii? <laughs> what was the talk? What was the mood? Well, the mood was always we can always win. I think the American. Psyche is not losing. We're losing. We're winners, so that that's part of it. But it was a lot of fear and a lot of uh, a lot of sleepless nights, because any time, you know, they sometimes there was nuisance bombing. They had, we'd come over at night and drop bombs with just just out of, not knowing what they're trying to hit, but that didn't last long. Sorry. The Japanese or the U.S. nuisance bomb? Japanese. Hawaii after? Yeah. I didn't know that. No, that's not true. Oh, okay. I take that back. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say, you're, you're teaching me something I, I no, never heard that before. That was on Guadalcanal, I think, that nuisance mm -hmm. bombing. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's so, too mixed up. Do you remember me. hearing on the radio President Roosevelt's speech? No, no. But you knew that war was declared? Yeah, I knew. Yeah, that was, we had a, we had a very wonderful uh, com captain uh, that was our commanding officer. His name was Captain Sanders. So he was very good with, the, with us in informing us. And I used to play piano for him and his wife in their, in their home when they were on the base. And uh, so just wonderful guy. Now, were you drafted or did you volunteer? I volunteered. You volunteered at 18? Yes. At 18, right out of high school. Yep. Where are you from originally? Iron Mountain, Michigan. Michigan. Which city? Iron Mountain. Iron Mountain. Okay. Okay. And uh, you graduated from high school up there and volunteered for the Army afterwards. When did you get shipped to Pearl Harbor? Well, when I... W a friend of mine and myself said, let's look into enlisting in, because we knew there was going to be something happening. And so I said, well, we went to the, in, in the enlistment place where they, to enlist. And so they took me and they didn't take him. So I was shipped out the next day. I never even said my folks, why? I was I shipped out and didn't even see them. To basic? Yeah. To Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. When did you arrive at Pearl Harbor? 
19... Shortly before the attack? Oh, yeah. Been there for a while? Oh, front. you hadn't been there very long. Yeah, we were there for... I would say we were in Pearl Harbor for almost about a year before it happened. A year? Wow. Yeah, I think so, Dutch. You enlisted in November of 1940. And I think from what you told me that you were at Jefferson ba Barracks, whatever, however that was, six weeks, I don't know, however that was. And then from there, you uh, went by train to the West Coast and then shipped over to Hawaii. Right, right. So maybe December or January or something, I don't know. Some, I don't remember. So after, after Pearl Harbor, a few weeks after Pearl Harbor, you participated in the planes moving to Christmas Island yeah. as a place to spread them out. And then when did you arrive on Christmas Island? One month after Pearl Harbor. One month. And then when did you arrive on the next island, do you remember? About, about a month later than that. And again, is that just putting new staging areas for planes to take yep. off from? And are you helping as far as your radioing, planes to land, take all, off, all communications? That. Just everything's the same. I was the operations officer, so I sort of took charge of that, of getting planes off and getting the crews for them and that type of thing. So next place, and these islands I've never heard of, New Hebrides? Hebrides. Hebrides. Hebr Hebrides. Okay. Palmyra, and then the New Hebrides. And then were you part of the initial invasion of Guadalcanal? No, that was the Marines. Okay. That was the Marines. We were there about... When we arrived there, all the treetops were chopped off from being shelled, and so, so the main attack was over. When did you arrive on Guadalcanal? Do you remember? Uh -uh, I don't remember. But it was about probably it wasn't too long after Pearl Harbor, maybe maybe two three months. Okay, and that was where. Did your service, I noticed that's the last place on the arrows, did your service end after Guadalcanal? Or? It did. I was due to come back to the States because you have to earn points after so many years in service. And I was due, my, I don't have the, the stripes. You have so many stripes, you get to go back to home. But I, I didn't go home because we went on from, had a chance to, to to re-enlist, but I didn't want to re-enlist either. So I, what, when was your discharge date? Do you remember? No. Was it 43, Barbara, 42? Barbara, no. Oh, 45. You were until 45. So were you on Guadalcanal that whole time? Yeah. The rest of the time, yeah. Wow, you were there for a long time. Yeah. Communicating planes, uh, bombers, or just uh, fighter planes? Fighter planes. We we were sharing a, a fighter strip with the Navy, which is right down the beach, and so, and we had our camp area was right above the airstrip, so we were bombed every night for twenty five nights straight. So Guadalcanal almost sounds more rough than Pearl Harbor. It was, for, you. for me it was, because it, it just every night we we got bombed, we just we never could rest. What airfield were you stationed at at Guadalcanal? There's no, there was no name. Just Guadalcanal. But you were stayed at the same airfield yeah. the whole time. Yeah. Did you see anything horrific as far as did you lose any friends on Guadalcanal or? No, not not there. Um, no, I didn't. But there was some, probably some close calls with that constant bombing. Oh yeah. There was, you know, they they would bomb us, and then I would play the piano after the bombing, and they could hear me over the whole outfit. And then the piano became known, so other outfits came from around the island and brought their own piano players and brought their own booze, and we had parties. Now, are you in a building, or are you playing out in the a open? tent? Tent. So you're having, so essentially you're calming everyone after a bombing on Guadalcanal. Right. So you became known to everyone on Guadalcanal. Were you the best piano player out there? I was the only one. <laughs> well, you said some other guys well, came, but they came uh, after arriving in Guadalcanal. There were other 
from the other branches of service. Like one with Navy uh, was an officer, and he played the piano, and came and played the piano, my piano. But so, you were the only one for the Army Air Corps. That's right. Were you playing for pilots as well, and maybe these fighter pilots had been? Oh, whoever. Maybe whoever. these guys had seen some pretty bad stuff in dogfights oh, with the yeah, Japanese. Sure. No, we, we didn't distinguish who should come. And they, they came, officers, and this the men together. Did you ever talk with some of the guys who had been in dogfights with the Japanese? Not that I remember. So you stayed on Guadalcanal, and was that until the war ended? No, it was Short not the war ended, but I, my term of, of sort of my hitch was up. And so I was supposed to come, I was supposed to go to Australia. And so instead of going to Australia, I had enough points to come back to the United States. So I came back to the United States. Do you remember what month that might have been? No. Oh. But it was before the war ended, obviously. Oh, yeah. So what did you, what was your rank when you left? Staff the sergeant. Staff sergeant. And what did you do after the service? Uh, I, I was a musician. I became a church musician. I was organist. You went to college first. Is that right? You went to college first. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you didn't just. Where did you go to school at? Lawrence University, Appleton, Wisconsin. On the GI Bill, I assume you were. Yes. And then what did you, musician, and then what did you do professionally? Well, I played the organ for church, and I had a dance band, and I had a school program teaching kids instruments. Band director. Band director. And where, what city was this? Was this where the college was, Lawrence, or? Lawrence, it was in Appleton, Wisconsin. And then, so did you do that as your whole career? Uh, yes. Bands? And what year did you retire? Well, you left Appleton in um, 1968 and went to Sioux Falls to become uh, director of the superintendent of schools for the Diocese uh -huh. of Sioux Falls. And I was there about six years. Sioux six Falls. years. And I became superintendent of schools for the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis. And I was there for 12 years. That's right. And then you came here in... Um, to Jacksonville? Yeah, 1986, to work for the uh, Bishop Snyder in the Catholic Diocese. Okay. As Director of Stewardship. And then what year did you retire? Oh, let's see. <laughs> What is Stumped her. We finally found him. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> let's see. When he was, he retired when he was eighty. So what year is that? Two thousand two. Yeah. Um, very good. Okay. Two thousand two. Wow. You worked for for quite a while doing. You know. Oh yeah, I had a great life. I loved everything I did. And how long have you two been married, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, no, I don't. We, we were married 65 years in June. In oh, June. Congratulations. Okay. Coming off a great So you age. knew him after Pearl yeah. Harbor? Yes, or okay. we met at college. Oh, uh, Lawrence. Yeah. Okay. We were both music majors. And then, you know, after he got his bachelor's degree, then he went to Northwestern University in Evanston and got a master's. And the GI Bill was so wonderful, he could have gone on to get a PhD, but he wanted to get to work. Yeah. And it must be interesting for you all these years to hear these stories of Pearl Harbor. I mean, what is your, you know, I guess what is your thought being married to a survivor of, you know, that iconic well, moment in yeah. American history? Well, in the beginning, it was, you know, it was just <laughs> something that all the guys did, you know. I mean, nobody, talk, they didn't talk about it. Uh, when I went to Lawrence, there were there were still some, like the upperclassmen were GI, ex-GIs, former GIs. And uh, no, they, I mean, they just got on with their lives. They uh, didn't talk about it much and ever. And then we came down here and I read in the paper that there was a meeting of, there was an association of Pearl Harbor survivors and they were gonna have lunch 
somewhere. So I called, there was a number there to call, and I called, and they were lovely people, and we, we became a member of that. So that was probably in 86. Probably in '86, we came here and we didn't know anybody looking for something to do, you know. So let's meet some people. Yes. Yeah, so they met monthly, and you know, most of them were sailors, had been in the Navy, and they had horrific stories to tell. Um, and um, now the 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 association is has. Um, what do you, how do you say, dissolved, it is no longer active, but there are sons and daughters of Pearl Harbor survivors who still meet monthly. A lot of pride there. Yeah, they are, but I think, I don't know why, the, maybe these men stayed in the Navy, you know, maybe that was why they, they were so like gung-ho for all this stuff. So coming into today, what does it mean to be able to carry on this tradition of such an iconic moment in American history? Well, I'm very proud of the fact that I contributed something to it. It wasn't much, but it was the best I could do. And I, I think I am proud of the fact that I provided a lot of entertainment for troops, for officers, for, because the piano like on Guadalcanal, was an attraction. We had every, almost every night there would be, somebody would come and want to play or, or listen and have a party. And so it was a, we were just, we called, where the piano was, it's called on Harmony Hill. And it was, it was a wonderful place. Did you, um, did it come into your mind maybe, and you know, obviously it was a very stressful time, but after Pearl Harbor, did, it, did you want to maybe do piano work then to kind of cheer the mood up there, or did you? Well, no, it just kind of <laughs> kind of came along with the flow of things. I uh, didn't do it deliberately. It just it just happened. But I always wanted to have the piano, and had that's why I had taken the piano from Hawaii to all the islands, ending up on Guadalcanal. That was a major accomplishment. Because it was, it was a huge gold ransom, and it weighed a ton, and it was put in a square case, and we put all our our blankets and all the stuff we could stuff in the box with the piano. So it was, it was a wonderful piece of furniture, for us. Hard to get it across the sea, though I'm sure. Yeah, well we, they they didn't they didn't know what the hell it was, so they except that guys and the sailors who unloaded the, the ships, caught on about, maybe about the third island. And they said, there's that damn piano again. And so, but then... The third island as in the New, new Hebrides. New Hebrides? Yeah. So what is, um, you know, what is your reflection on how America, you know, keeps up with remembering Pearl Harbor? Are you pretty satisfied with annual remembrances, anything? Or do you, you know, what is your perspective of you know, not your own reflections, but how America views Pearl Harbor as a whole. Well, I think they've done very well. I think that the men that were involved with that are are pleased that they continue to be remembered, and I think their families are too, because it was a horrendous experiment. It's not an experiment, but it was experience. Experience. That's the word, and and it was not. Something we were planned for, it was absolutely, I would say terrible, it was a nightmare. And so, uh, just glad to survive it. Anything you want to ask? Do you, do you remember Captain Sanders' first name? Oh, gosh. He was your immediate oh, wait, it supervisor? Might be this, it might be, wait a minute, it might oh, be able to tell you. <laughs> I might be able to tell you. Here's a Thanksgiving dinner, November 20th, 1941. Oh, wow. Like uh, two weeks before the menu. Wait a minute, where is this? Uh, here. I almost got it. Uh, oh, 
it says L period M period Sanders. Third net part. Al Sanders, okay. Uh, L. 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 Do you still keep in touch with the other survivors in the state? I know there's a few in the Jacksonville area. Not else. anymore. I did for a while. But just, you know, it's just too much. No, it's too hard to get around. Mm -hmm. But we keep it, we get every, the, the sons and daughters are really sweet. They send us a monthly letter inviting us to the luncheon. And it was just this past Saturday in St. Augustine. And I asked Dutch if he wanted to go and... I mean, it's hard, you know, it's, it's physically uh, difficult. So I don't know if any of his, the ones that we knew, I don't even know if they're still with us. Do you mind me asking your age? I probably could do the math. But... How old are you? 94. 94. Oh, perfect. 94. Yeah, just had a birthday. Get it. And sorry, I, I, you may have already told me, what was your division in the Army? I was in the Air Corps. What was the Army Air Corps. What was your... 46 Fighter Squadron. 46 Fighter Squadron. Yeah. Um, just another question that I have. Do you remember when you first heard the President's speech about it being a day that would live, live in infamy? And um, would you have seen it in the news later that week, like in a paper? Or was it well after the war when... I don't remember. You, know, you would not. They would not have. It was utter... Yeah. That's, that's, I'm sure there were no, no politics or no outside so. coverage. I mean, maybe the officers, but God, I don't see how the privates would hear anything. Yeah. Was there any other memories that you've heard before that we didn't touch well, on? Well, the one, to, when he was in um, a Fete on this little island, a Fete, there it had there was a French family that lived there. Yeah. And they, uh, they had some kind of a plantation. And the women there uh, did the laundry for right. the soldiers, right? For those, yeah, we were, we were just right near, right near there. And they did the laundry for us. Uh -huh. and, and I played the piano. She had a piano. So I went in and played the piano. She just cried when I played because she, she ne nobody could play it, so she had the piano, and I played the piano, and so, I, and then I got a big, big dessert, and then I went there every week and played. Now before all this in Pearl Harbor, it almost sounds like you know, night before it happens, you're playing a piano, at the officers club, and you've done that pretty regularly. It almost sounds like a okay time, pretty fun out there. I mean, in your in your time leading up to Pearl Harbor. What was what was it like then? It almost I mean you're in Hawaii, you're well, playing piano. Before the before the war, it was a nice place to be. And you know, there's good weather. It couldn't be better. You play tennis every day. You play tennis play. every day, yeah. Oh, no, it was some great. Of your favorite memories, but do you have memories from before then that you that stick out in your mind? Before Pearl Harbor. Before the attack, yeah. yeah. In Hawaii before for the year we were there before, what did you do? I worked on airplanes, you yeah. know, radio man. And played tennis? Pl played, played tennis, tennis every day. day. Uh, we only worked half days, you know. And so half the day was sort of fun, played tennis. And I had the dance band, and that was it. And you played poker, you told me? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Tell them how you got the money to buy the piano. Oh, you were a card truck out there. I played poker because there's nothing else to do. So we played poker almost every day. And I was very lucky at poker. In fact, I was sent home $700 or something over a period of two or three weeks. Did you have to hire a, a shakedown man to make sure you got paid? <laughs> no, no problem. You know, it was, uh, I love playing poker. Do you remember the, that night of Pearl Harbor after the attack? Did you get to sleep? What was? Oh, there was no sleep. For a couple of days, or? No, for for sure. I don't think I slept for a couple of days. And that it was just, it was so unbelievable that this would happen, and it was not in our 
in our my experience at all, and never, th and I you know I used to think what I would do, but I never, I just never never had it. Nope. So you must have had to clean up. Did you have equipment? You had to remove the planes from the. Oh yeah, well, the hangar was a mess, and there was about half a foot of water from trying to get the put the fires out. And it was burning hot. Did you man any of the hoses? No. I, I had to get, I had to get from, a, I had my orders were to get, when there's an attack, you go out to the end of the field and that's where that command post was. And uh, and then you call into Fort Shafter and get your, get your instructions. Surely they had heard about it by then. Oh yeah. Shafter. Everybody, we were probably the last ones that you heard about that started they attacked other parts of the island before they attacked the airfield. When the attack was going on and you were <coughs> up against that wall and then behind the sandbags, were you praying at this? Oh yeah. There's no uh, there's no non believers I, I, in a foxhole, right? I prayed all the time. I never stopped praying. I mean, did you were you when the attack was going on, were you praying? Oh sure. Do you remember what you would have been praying? <laughs> I just prayed for you to be to end up alive. I just, I just, I didn't pray any bad things about anybody else. I just hoped that we get over with it. Have you since been back? Yes. Several times. Or? How many times? Well, we went. Back, we went back for the fiftieth. Fiftieth. Twenty-five years ago. Ninety-one. And uh, and then he took me to uh, Wheeler Field, and uh, of course, you know, I don't know if it was the same or different, I can't remember what he said, and out to Dillingham Ranch. That's where we had, after the war started, that's where we went from Wheeler Field to Dillingham Ranch. That's where we had our... And, and out there, you remember on the beach, there were still remnants of gun emplacements all, all along the beach. Was it weird going back there and seeing these same, because Maybe after the war was fifty years later. Was that the first time you had seen it since? Yeah. yeah. What was it like? I mean, is was your barracks still there? Were your barracks? Sure. Well, I don't really know. What was it? Do you remember what it was like though? Just to be back to this spot that was that you had been there fifty years before. I guess I just was. Maybe I thought how lucky I was to be alive. That's all. Yeah. I don't think any. Nothing else. And then the, another t time we went there, I can't, I don't know exactly the uh, time span here. Um, Dutch had played the organ in a little church. What was the name of the little community where you played the organ? Wailea. Wailea? In Hawaii. In Hawaii. It was near his field. And when we were there, we had, we, we went there to give a talk for the Archdiocese of Honolulu. And um, we rented a car and he drove me out there and he said, let's, let's just see if we can find that church. And this was after we'd given the talk in Honolulu and it was at a hotel. And so we turned this corner and he said, there it is. It's, I think it was St. Joseph Church. Yeah. And we parked the car and, and it, the church had enormous wooden doors and they were locked so I thought oh well you know he said I sure would like to see you that. at least got to see it though <laughs> see if that organ is there well then then the doors open and they, I mean and this woman says Mr. and Mrs. Schultz she knew you were coming I said I was like ah <laughs> and and she said I was at the talk yesterday or whenever it was she remembered you. I'll be yeah. darned. How cool. So, and then he said, well, I played the organ in this church and, and uh, up in the Before loft. Pearl Harbor. It, uh, me? Before Pearl Harbor. After Pearl Harbor. Yeah, right. Before, right. Before the war started, you played there. Okay. And um, the organ is still up there, but they don't use it anymore. Do you remember that? Now they have yeah. an organ up in yeah. the front of the church. I'll be darned. I mean, that was like, when she's... When she knew my, our name, I thought, oh my God, what you is were, You were that? a local legend, and you didn't even like, know it. Ah! That's pretty neat. 
Ethan, did you have anything else? No, this has been amazing. This has been amazing. I'd like to take more photos of that. And any yeah, yeah, if we could, and we could 